You're listening to the Quality Speak Weekly Podcast. 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 Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the PolitiSpeak Weekly Podcast. Wherever you're listening to us, whether that's on iTunes, whether that's on uh, YouTube, or whether that's on the website or through the Facebook, there's lots of ways you can get to us. This is episode four for 12-15-2016 from Russia with love. As always, I am joined by my good friend Nate on the other side of the microphone from me. And this week we have a lot to cover, as we always do. We want to get into a little bit about the DNC leadership fight that's going on right now. We want to get into uh, uh, the big question of what's going on with Biden. He said a few things. We want to talk about uh, some of Trump's supporters, not just in this country, but uh, in places of power around the world. We also want to get into our main feature this week about Russian hacking, uh, not just what it is, but how it happened, what's happening, and some technical aspects about it that you may not have heard. Uh, pundits are just going back and forth about hacking this, hacking that. But we want to get into a few details to get you uh, involved in that. Uh, and then if we have a little bit of time, we got some fun stuff at the end. But our big story starting this off that I'm going to toss to Nate here is about Dylan Roof, uh, the South Carolina church shooting bad guy, terrible person. Uh, we have some news on him that came out basically just today. And I'm going to toss to Nate and he's going to get us started on what is important here. Yeah, just today, which has been, especially coming so shortly after that mistrial for the officer who murdered Walter Scott on camera, this definitely feels like some very, very small glimmer of good news, which shouldn't be surprising. I mean, I, I think some people were a little bit too pessimistic about how this would play out. But, it, you know, it seemed to me that, I mean, this was just as sinister as it gets. Yeah, this is about as dark as, as it gets. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's a it was a terrible, terrible thing. And this guy, and even during uh, the news that came out today, this guy's a monster, man. No, yeah, I mean, he's a he's a straight up white supremacist, and and he's also I mean, when when you listen to him talk or you, you read any of, of his writing, I mean, he, he's he's also just like a very. I mean, he's not like an incidental racist. He's not like some, you know, a, a lot of people these days, especially, you know, with social media and celebrities with platforms. I mean, people kind of stumble into find new ways to be problematic. Right. And, you, know, you have these people like Amy Schumer and Lena Dunham and all these people with these, you know, kind of big mouths and they 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 make jokes that are inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera. But and this was a man, a young man with a very articulated and chillingly thought out philosophy of of the world that definitely aligned with you know white governments elsewhere and and white elites elsewhere to keep you know a a racial caste system and you know he wanted to start a race war oh yeah he was very intent on that i mean this was not just wake up one day uh, and you're going to do something terrible and then you know off yourself and move on this was a very long process i mean he went into the methodist episcopal church in downtown uh, charleston Back this summer, it was June 17th, and he went in, and then for nearly an hour, which is a, an incredibly long time, about the length of these podcasts, he sat there among them during their Bible study, just opened fire, and just kept going. I mean, it took forever. Being inside that church, I can't even imagine uh, what went on through there. Yeah, and, and they were, I mean, attacking attacking the black church in general, but specifically that AME church, I mean, that it, which is of such historic significance, is, I mean, there, there was a real method to that madness, but it's also what made it so creepy and insidious. I mean, that you, I mean, you look at the pictures of, of these nine poor lost souls, and I mean, they just look like some of the best people you could ever meet. And my, you know, by all accounts, they, they took him in and they were, they were friendly and they prayed with him and they, you know, they treated him like they would treat any other, you know, guest to their church. Right. And he turned around and then it just made it so icky. But fortunately, obviously today he you know, has been found guilty on all 33 counts, um, you know, which is, and just a question of now whether he's going to be put to death, which is its whole other can of worms. And, you know, whether even someone like this deserves the death penalty is, I mean, it's a pretty ripe and provocative question. It seems that polling in South Carolina intriguingly shows that African Americans don't want to see him executed, whereas white American, uh, whereas white uh, South Carolinians do. 
Uh, but that's just kind of a perennial divide on the death penalty and capital punishment in general, where blacks are just way more, way more skeptical of the system, obviously. I know I am, yeah, as a Hispanic person. And same thing even with the Republican side of my Hispanic family is very staunchly against, you know, or very tepid to even bring up the uh, death penalty in situations because it just, there's something about it that just, you know, it goes back however long it's just about state sponsored murder in a, in a sense it is i mean there, there's no i mean I, I think with the late christopher hitchens who uh who passed away five years ago today uh, what he called it uh so memorably uh, being human sacrifice i mean there was there was there's no other functional purpose for it but this kind of sick barbaric ritual um but that said at the same time i personally am opposed to the death penalty i don't think we should have the death penalty in any cases but i do kind of think it's morally it's it's a little absurd intellectually to treat every case morally the same that the death penalty could arise meaning basically i mean you you take a guy like dylan roof or a guy, I don't even want to use his name, the, the guy who shot up uh, Sandy Hook, who obviously yeah. didn't, didn't live through that day. But, I mean, for sake of argument, if, 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 that, if that young man had been taken alive, um, there, that's just not on the same moral level as a lot of other murder. I mean, murder is murder, true, obviously. But there are cases that are just so offensive to, to society that it, 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 this just isn't the same to me as, as most of them. And, and where I wouldn't support the death penalty in any case, I'm also not someone who goes out and protest in these cases either. I mean, you wouldn't find me outside his jailhouse, outside the prison, you know, crying and, you know, leading some candlelit vigil, vigil for him. I mean, he, he earned it. I mean, oh, if he, he knew he, what he was, he, he knew what he was doing because he, he'd said it himself when he went in and he spared that one lady, uh, I believe it, her name was Shepard, he asked her if, if she was shot, and she said no. And he says, I'm not going to, and this is from his transcript, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave you here to tell the story. I mean, this guy is the worst of the worst, and he expected to be killed. He did not, ex- I, he did not expect to come out of there. Uh, I mean, and we you talked about it saying it's it's this white supremacist. I mean, it's true because he even he says no one else was brave enough when he was talking uh, in this taped interview because he believed that white people had already become second class citizens. But even through all that uh, in his taped interview about sparing that woman, he said in his own words that he didn't shoot her because she was and I quote like looking at me. So he knew somewhere deep there down in that craziness of whatever consciousness he has that what he was doing he knew was wrong and he knew he couldn't help himself but he's a monster but the death penalty is still such a touchy subject for a lot of people and in a case as clear cut as this i'm not going to lose any sleep over it if it if it does come to pass um, but there's been so many cases of of people on death row that have been exonerated over the years that it makes me wary every single time. Absolutely. We, we shouldn't have a death penalty, but at the same time, as long as these laws are on the books, when, when people act this out of line with society's values, I mean, and, and, and even too, I mean, the, the, the matter of the church, uh, and, and not just, you know, the historical significance of, of, of the black church and this church in particular, but, but a, you know, a religious sanctuary. I mean, the, the, violating that just goes so far beyond the the imaginable i mean even more so than a movie theater or something i mean these are all obviously just i mean completely morally abhorrent and horrifying cases but i mean this this did seem to be in a league of its own which is you know how he was found guilty on 33 counts of uh you know hate crimes today and so the, the suspense will be next year whether he uh when, when they enter the penalty phase of the trial whether right. he gets the death penalty I seems to me that it's it's very hard to imagine he wouldn't get it, but I also, you know, it's coming after the the, the Walter Scott mistrial. This this is a relief, but it's not 
you know, it's not necessarily a surprise. I mean, this was just such a league of its own that, I mean, even for all the pessimism you can have about America and, you know, the, the racism in the system and all that stuff that's totally valid, I mean, th- th- there was just no way that that this wasn't going to be the outcome. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, there are a lot more people who apologize for police violence and support really, really egregious mistreatment of people of color I think then actually cheer on Dil- the Dylan Roos of the world. <laughs> yeah, I think I think everyone can agree that this this man is a monster. And the only surprising thing is that even I think even to him is that he came away out of this alive. I mean, he knew what he was doing. When they asked him, you know, did he think uh, these people in this church were bad people or something like trying to get inside his head? He himself stated they're in a church. They weren't criminals or anything. So there's, this is strictly boils down to just evil. And I think everyone can get behind it uh, if the death penalty does come into play. But, man, I, don't, I really don't know what his attorneys are, are going to play. They're, the only card they have is to try to plead this down to life in prison. And so, but I don't know. I just I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to put this guy... They're going to put him to death as quickly as they can. It's terrible, but no, I don't. I don't think many people are going to be protesting. I don't think many people are going to be crying. I don't think so either. Yeah. Uh, and so, with that aside, which is terrible enough news, we we move on into some political news now uh, about the DNC and the current leadership fight that they're having uh, now that this election is over and now that they're into a rebuilding phase. Uh, and I know Nate has a bunch to say on this, so we'll get us started. Well, the news this week, that w- the development since last week, when we actually really, we, we kind of intended to get into this, and, and we, there's just so much going on that this just got pushed a little back. It seemed a little less uh, pertinent than some of the things going on with Trump's cabinet. But we have the announcement this week that Tom Perez has entered the DNC race. So that is going to, uh, that, that we won't get the vote on that we won't get the outcome until next february when the uh when the, when the party chairs uh, when the dnc members vote on this but it seems like perez and ellison uh keith ellison of minnesota congressman are going to be the two primary contenders there there are other people there's i mean howard dean had announced shortly after the election that he was going to get back in again, and that didn't last very long at all. Yeah. <laughs> He'd already backed out within a matter of weeks because I mean he he was already kind of you know damaged goods as far as this last cycle went, where you know he had he had endorsed Hillary and he had you know he's done lobbying work for you know uh, yeah. the. The uh, health insurance or uh, industry, I believe. So, I mean, he's he was kind of probably too old and problematic for this. I kind of mean old, both in like the chronological sense and maybe also kind of in like the political moment sense. <laughs> and, I mean, and people still remember him for one thing and in, in that weird scream, which I still think is funny that something so minuscule and minor led to his downfall during that primary cycle itself. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it was amazing. When but you think of this cycle and everything that people have been saying. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that looks, when you <laughs> compare to how the Republican primary looked with Gingrich in it in 2012, and then certainly the, the primary and the general election, because Trump didn't get better behaved in the general. He got more Trumpy. So yeah, there, Howard Dean laughs funny and loses it all, and then Donald Trump, you know advocates grabbing women by the pussy and is our new president so we've come a long way in a few years <laughs> right I- exactly but i mean i mean there, were, there was a great irony even then of course that i mean howard dean was this very centrist democrat I yeah. mean, a very very middle of the road guy who got to posture in the 2004 democratic primary as this you know kind of liberal insurgent but i mean it was it was bizarre i mean he was like probably the closest to the center just about of anyone certainly you know compared to Kerry. but i mean that that was that was just different times and they all look kind of more conservative than compared to now because the, of how much the party is moving and i i think that's something that's said now that, that's pointed at 
about the Ellison uh, Perez feud is, I guess, the contest face off would be the, the right battle, word. whatever. Yeah, it's something. Whatever yeah, it is, it's uh, going to get let's, bad. Yeah. Yeah, let's make this as kind of grandiose as we can. The Battle Royale <laughs> next February until the 404. Excuse me, 447 DNC members wisely uh, select their uh, voice for the wilderness. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, I, I guess. I guess that's pretty lyrical. But that's a good one. Yeah, Perez is. I mean, both these men, Perez and Ellison, are are definitely left of center. I mean, Ellison is is staked out even further to the left. I mean, Ellison. I mean, he's a congressman. He's the first Muslim elected to Congress. He's from the 5th District in Minnesota. He's been apparently been very good at turnout uh, in his uh, 10 years in office. Uh, he's also a co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. I mean, this you know, you know, sometimes you have people kind of cynically describe the Democratic Party as as this center right organization that's just so much further to the right than the ostensible progressive or liberal parties would be in any other country. Which I, I mean, I I think that's very opportunistic usually from the kind of left wingers who say that. But I mean, the Congressional Pro- Progressive Caucus is like the actual robustly left wing of the Democratic Party. I mean, in, in 2011, uh, when Paul Ryan unveiled the budget that made him so hated and feared on the Democratic side and so adored on most of the right, and, you know, uh, enough so that Mitt Romney was infatuated enough that he made Ryan his right. Wing. Yeah, I mean, the, the Congressional Progressive Caucus at the same time, though, got a lot less media attention. I mean, just dramatically less political attention. They unveiled their alternative, which was what they called the People's Budget. And it was a much more aggressive, much more stridently uh, progressive program that would have. Brian didn't eliminate the debt in his platform until like the late 2030s maybe and it was kind of murky exactly you know what would be cut and how that would work but the progressive budget was you know very very specific they were they were going to bring balance by 2021 with these steep upper income tax increases and defense cuts so i mean ellison comes from i mean he's a single payer advocate perez on the other hand is also someone who's very much vocally in favor of the of the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. I mean, he's he's gone behind that fight. the The thing that the thing about Ellison is that he comes with controversy, but so does Perez. And Perez was aligned with with Clinton. There were there were people who thought that Perez might even be Hillary Clinton's running mate. Right. But Ellison, the thing he has in his favor, I, I think one of the things is that. Frankly, at this moment, he seems to have the most people kind of behind him. I mean, some people as different as centrist, you know, kind of Wall Street Democrat Chuck Schumer and fiercely anti-Wall Street populist Elizabeth Warren have both endorsed him. Uh, The AFL-CIO has, uh, you know, the nation's largest federation of unions has endorsed him. Of course, Bernie Sanders, who Ellison had you know, Ellison was one of the few Congress people to endorse Sanders, and, right. especially, uh, and Sanders, of course, is fervently backing him. So he has that going on for him, and he looks plausibly like a uniter. And I think that I think there is a good case for him. He's also a very likable guy. I mean, he. I, I remember some years back, Bill Maher making a pretty you know politically incorrect joke when he found <laughs> out that he found out that Ellison was a convert to Islam and Mars joke was oh that's interesting i didn't know you spent any time in prison <laughs> <laughs> yeah inappropriate but you know Ellison actually took that in pretty good humor and i mean he he seemed good natured about it and in in 2013 after minnesota had legalized uh, marriage equality that was the law of the land he um, he st- strummed the guitar and he sang Woody Guthrie's This Land Is Your Land. I mean, he's he's a likable guy. I think he's in line with with where the party needs to be going. And he also, the Bernie Sanders uh, support, I think can only really help him now with that part of the populace that felt left out by the Democratic Party. But one issue with him, uh, and this is an interesting one, is that the most resistance towards him is actually coming out of the White House itself. Yeah, that's... Well, I mean, he's also... I mean, besides that, and, and you, you know, 
Well, Obama had chosen. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, the 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 incumbent, the president, is the person who chooses the head. Mm -hmm. So w when they're in office, you know, Obama in, in 2009 had chosen Tim Kaine. Uh, and then after that, he had chosen Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And of course, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is this completely, just really in a lot of ways, insufferable political hack, as so many of them are. And I, I can't mean, stand her just at all. <laughs> no, she's just, I mean, she's she was bad at her job. She did a terrible job of looking impartial. And I mean, I, I think the case that the DNC had just, you know, completely weighted the scales and screwed over Bernie. I mean, I, you know, I, I think a lot of that was overstated. And quite frankly, an independent who was, a, you know, a member of the party for like two seconds really can't expect that much of a fair hearing. Right. He was but, never but, going to, you know, be welcomed with complete open arms like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he, you know, he, I guess he registered and he left, but, you know, and, and there's, there's obviously a case in retrospect that they, you know, had kind of done a little bit too much to make it look like they cleared the field and for Hillary and, and you know, really competition would have been better. But the point is Debbie Wasserman Schultz is just not a, an appealing person. She was not good at handling all this, but I, that's obviously not to just come pick on her. I mean, Rand's previous her counterpart at the Republican uh, at the RNC is just awful. I mean, he's, <laughs> I mean, he's a he's a dick. <laughs> I mean, he's just I mean, he's a shit. He's a shitty person. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, he legitimately seems like someone of coarse, low character, and you know, he, him moving into the chief of staff for Trump certainly kind of speaks to that. But I mean, that's you know, these are kind of the people you know, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Tim Kaine. I mean, these are. You know, th this is about fundraising, and this is kind of about party mobilization and organization. And, you know, this is not a philosopher king type job. I mean, this is not for the most erudite people, per se. Uh, this is kind of people who, in a way, kind of are political hacks and who, you know, who kind of know or feel like they know how to run the game. I mean, I think Ellison and uh, Perez are much more ideological, but like I said, that speaks to where the Democratic Party is now in 2016. That Perez, who if you know if Perez had entered the the presidential primary in 2004 or 2008, would have been stridently liberal. I mean, it would have been considered like the left wing of of debate. Yeah, the far end. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe not quite, you know, Dennis Kucinichi or something, but certainly more in like the, you know, kind of plausible contender sort of category he would have been. And now he's the centrist alternative, which, I mean, I mean he's the relatively more moderate alternative because, I mean, one of the, one of the sticking points, which I'm sure will be litigated more in the next couple months, is that Perez had supported TPP. Right. Which, of course, Hillary had as well, but then she very opportunistically, I don't think anyone in the world believed that she actually opposed it, but then she flipped around and said that she didn't support it, which I think was just a mistake. I think, I, I, I generally think politicians should just own whatever they do, and I think that hurt, I, I think that hurt Marco Rubio greatly on the other side with immigration reform. I think so, I mean, too, yeah. If, you're gonna, if I mean, you say something, just go to bat for it and just... Yeah, don't try to figure out a way out of it later. Just look, this is what happened. Okay. Yeah, because no one believes you. I mean, there, there are some <laughs> of these. We, yeah, I mean, we had talked about last week, you know, the, the, some of these kind of litmus test issues. I mean, uh, specifically with, with Tim Ryan when he challenged Nancy Pelosi. I mean, he had last year suddenly become pro choice. Dennis Cassandra had done it before. And you see that on the other side, too, on abortion, but also, you know, Chris Christie, who used to be someone who was, you know, more vocally in support of gun control, you know, started becoming more of a pro gun governor. I mean, you kind of see that. But those are kind of like these ideological litmus tests that you kind of flip around. But when you are like actively, as Hillary was with TPP and then Marco Rubio with the Gang of Eight and the Senate on immigration reform, in 2013 i mean when you have really entered the fray and then you turn around and try and act like you were never in the fight and that you don't support what you had <laughs> what you had invested so much time in that's just that doesn't sit right with the voters no it, i mean it really doesn't it just they can i mean we we talk about the education levels and, and all this of, of voters but they're going to see through you. It doesn't take a lot to be able to see through someone when they're just bullshitting straight in front of your face. Yeah, and something that, 
you know, Ellison and Perez, I mean, I, I think that speaks highly to both of them is that they are probably men who will stand by whatever positions they've had. Now, one of the controversial issues there is something that it looks like Ellison kind of had flipped on, which is where some of the controversy about him comes, which I think some of, to be fair, is just kind of anti-islam prejudice and baiting i mean i think he as a as a practicing muslim is going to run into some of that which is you know obviously just deeply unfortunate uh but the other thing is is some of his kind of past ties and some of the things he said about israel i mean he he in 2010 made a pretty pretty clumsy remark about how israel can't treat america like an like an atm i do remember that yeah yeah i mean even by the standards of, of critiquing israel I'm, I'm certainly someone who doesn't think israel is above criticism i, mean, I think there's actually quite a few things they do that they should be amply subjected to uh, scrutiny on um you know th- so there, there was that but you know on the other hand j street the the kind of third way uh, pro israel group that's kind of in the middle and has supported obama when obama has actually kind of picked some fights with the more uh, you know the more hardline is- israeli groups and and randy weingarten of the teachers union she's defended him too saying that you know what what his career and his, his life is about is not anti-semitism so i i think there, that's just going to be an issue, but I don't know if that's going to sink him. And I mean, he's already, you know, Chuck Schumer is, is Jewish and, and he doesn't seem to have any cause, uh, just as Bernie Sanders, they haven't. So that, there's nothing that you could stick to him to say that, like, he's actually said anything actually anti Semitic. There were just some clumsy remarks about Israel. But in general, his kind of critique of Israel really isn't that out of step with where a lot of Jewish Americans are, you know. So I, I think I think it would be possible for attempts to portray him as an extremist to overshoot, but unfortunately, that is one of the issues overhanging him right now. There's also there was also in 2007, he he made some remarks about 9/11, likening right likening them to the uh, Reichstag fire in Germany in the Third Reich. Which I think was another just kind of clumsy remark. I, I don't think he was actually suggesting, you know, some of these, you know, uh, jet fuel can't melt steel beams type of ins- <laughs> insanity. I, I, I think he was actually just making a point about the way that Muslims were treated and Arab Americans and others following that. And I, I think he would do well to make sure he never says something like that again. Which I don't think there's, I don't think there's too much else that he's said along those lines but the other real sticking point for him the the other thing that is kind of haunting him at least somewhat in the press was his past associations with farrakhan of the controversial islam which he had defended farrakhan and some other far left uh and kind of you know fringe characters about their kind of militant statements yeah he said that farrakhan you know wasn't an anti-semite back in the in the early 90s yeah, I mean, he had defended these people. There's no, there's no instances that we know of where he himself had said anything anti-Semitic, but it was just kind of this pattern of defending Farrakhan and others when accusations were brought that they were being anti-Semitic. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he has some issues, but there's nothing overt that he himself has been involved with or done. And I do think that leading the DNC... I think he is more in line with the majority of people. Maybe not the current uh, uh, layout of what the DNC is right now or in line with the Obama administration. But I think after this election, what we've seen is that he falls into into more in line with the people as opposed to the politicians. Yeah, and that, and that is something that, that will be held against Perez to a certain degree. I mean, Perez was, was I believe, vetted for the VP role that ultimately went to Tim Kaine. He's also, and this is where some controversy is coming in on the other side besides TPP, there's apparently reports that he had advised Hillary in her campaigning 
against Bernie to portray him as the candidates, the candidate of whites and basically not for minorities. So that will, you know, that would presumably be something on, on his end, but I, both of them are left of center and where I think Perez really kind of has the upper hand is he doesn't have some of that baggage. I mean, Ellison didn't really kind of disavow Farrakhan and Nation of Islam until he ran in 2006. So that's another one where that kind of looks fairly timely and opportunistic. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden when he runs for Congress, that, that's finally when he disavows. So my personally, if I was if I had a vote in this, I would go with Perez, though I think Ellison is a strong choice in a lot of ways. And there are other ones that might seem important to talk about later on. And there's uh, Elsa Hoag of, of uh, NARAL. Some people have even floated around the, n- the name of uh, Denise Richards of Planned Parenthood. There are others, but these these two are the main contenders. But both of them could thread the needle pretty well. I mean, you know, both of them are, are, are not white. They're, you know, obviously Ellison being Muslim. Perez is, you know, son of Dominican immigrants. I think where Perez looks really good is right now you kind of have this debate in the Democratic Party and in, in the left about, you know, so-called identity politics and is the party about bread and butter economic populism and speaking to class or is it about kind of these more cultural civil rights issues and like speaking to groups as groups instead of a unified whole? My own politics is I think identity politics is civil rights. And I think right. most of the critiques of identity politics uh, really kind of fail. And they're usually brought by people who don't seem to get that. But I think Perez would be very good on those grounds that he has both the civil rights experience I mean, that's what he did uh, before becoming Obama's secretary of labor in 2013 was he was the assistant attorney general for, for civil rights. And he has a career that speaks both to economics and these fundamental existential issues of, of you know, being protected under the law from from police, from racists, from others. I, I think he would be a very good voice for the democratic party in the wilderness i think so i mean between the two of them uh we have a strong choice and easily above anything that that washerman was uh because she was so terrible that she makes both of these candidates just look like heaven on earth to to anyone looking because of of everything that happened and this kind of leads us into a little bit of the next question uh about Joe Biden. We don't know what's going on with him. There was interviews where he was he said that, you know, jokingly, of course, that he's going to run in 2020. But the Washington Post came out with a with a good piece uh, saying he is the best choice to run the DNC right under our noses. Uh, He's a champion of civil rights, of women's rights. He's a friend of cops, but he's also uh, understanding of, of Black Lives Matter. He supports the working class. Uh, and and, you know, he comes from a much loved administration even though uh, the dnc is kind of in shambles after losing but he is he's go i i believe that that he is going to be a player in some form i don't know if he's going to go up and be the next leader of the dnc or put in his hat into that race um, but clearly we haven't seen the last of joe biden let's hope not because in a politics that is so often just so dispiriting and so nasty and so off-putting in so many ways i mean joe biden really is this lovable guy (laughs) joe biden is just a really really nice man and it's refreshing to see him out just being himself and i am i am a little sad that that he didn't toss his hat into this race this time around yeah his his gaffes are endearing i mean sometimes he just (laughs) kind of more than obama would he kind of channels what we're all thinking and feeling the, the, yeah, he doesn't. He hasn't made any like terrible things. He just gaffs a lot, but almost like, kind of like your dad would, in, in, in that kind of sense. And I, I am gonna miss him. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna miss him too. And in fact, in 2008, I was pretty sympathetic to his pitch to be the nominee that time. And that's what he's wanted his whole life. I mean, he's he's wanted to be president. That that's probably been his like single animated thought. And he got so close, and he wound up being this really important vice president and someone who looked especially really good after 
kind of the sinister menace of Dick Cheney for for eight years, and I, I think he kind of washed away some of that. And but but the problem with Biden is, especially if he's talking about you know a twenty twenty run, which I I think is ill advised, just on the level that he's too old. Yeah, so I agree. I mean, he was too old this year. I mean, he loved the guy, but I mean, the presidency is a very demanding job, and I. I just think he's past a certain point where you could start that job. But the the other issue with Biden is, especially in the age of kind of activism and everything that's kind of been pushing the Democratic Party into some of these new, more harder line positions on everything from abortion to immigration, et cetera, Biden isn't exactly a natural fit for that. I, you know, he wrote the 1994 crime bill that's so controversial. <laughs> That's true. He's a, you know, he's a practicing Catholic who is a lot more queasy and ambivalent about abortion than most others in the party. And as the party becomes more ag- aggressively and forcefully pro-choice, I don't, I don't think Biden seems like the right guy for that moment. I mean, he was privately like other Catholics in Obama's administration, where when when they passed down that when the HHS passed down the contraceptive rule he was not a fan of that um and also he's from delaware i mean his you know hillary got all this grief about you know she's the candidate of of goldman sachs and wall street and all this well biden did much more on behalf of these financial firms with bankruptcy law etc so i'm there biden is a is a really good guy and there's a lot that he's like politically strong on but there's also that a lot that would be litigated if he tried to run for dnc chair potentially but especially if he ran in 2020 or tried to do anything like that i think biden has just had a remarkable life i think he should write memoirs and do whatever he wants to kind of do behind the scenes and just go on being right off right off into the sunset and and call it good because he's he's paid his dues (laughs) yeah that's i mean he made it to vice president that's closer than Almost anyone on the planet has ever gotten to that level of power. I mean, they, yeah, there's a very, it's a very small club. <laughs> and he's been in it and he's been remarkable. And, you know, even people on the other side, I think, have a certain liking for Joe Biden. Biden's a good guy. All right. And with that, uh, we move into our big, big, big topic of this week that we want to get into. And this is something that's dominated the headlines for the past few days essentially right after the election, is Russian hacking. Now, this is a contentious subject from both sides, and a lot is being said. But there there are some things that I find really interesting about this and that I need to bring up. Uh, We want to get into some of the facts behind the hacks, some things that we already know, some things that we don't know, because there's a lot of speculation out there. But there is a lot that we do actually know and that I have some insight on not just being a journalist because that's my job but going back earlier in my life as as a cybersecurity uh, expert back when it was in its infancy of course it's a lot of that is well beyond me now but I still understand the basics so I've been saying for very for years and years and years that cybersecurity is something that's been overlooked in this country and this is one of the big divides between say our generation and the baby boomer generation if you were raised with a computer you have a basic understanding of what it can do and what it can't. If you weren't raised with one, you're adverse to it. And if you look at everyone in Congress, if you look at everyone in government, the majority of the people in charge uh, come from a generation before computers and don't understand the intricacies of the networks and how things work. They understand how a computer works and what it does and, and all that stuff, but they don't understand the underlying nature of what the Internet is and how hacking works. Now, Donald Trump... Uh, we all know he's a crazy man, but he has made the claim just, I, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, uh, he tweeted out talking about this Russian hack. He said, if Russia or some other entity was hacking, why did the White House wait so long to act? Why did they only complain after Hillary lost? Now, if we've learned anything from Trump, if we learned anything from his tweets, uh, is to take them with a grain of salt because he likes to exaggerate things. But in this case, he's actually 100% factually incorrect. So he wants to know why this stuff is coming up now, why it's such a big deal now. Well, actually, 
the administration, the Obama administration, announced its findings about Russian involvement in these hacks a month before Election Day. So this was made public a month before the end. And actually, on October 7th, uh, looking at my notes here, it was only a few months after the WikiLeaks release of the DNC emails uh, that the administration came out and said it was confident behind the cyber attacks that they were coming from Russia. On that very same day on the 7th, uh, they actually made a joint statement from the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Director of National Intelligence uh, that released to the public that said the U.S. intelligence community, USIC, is confident that the Russian government directed the recent compromises of emails from U.S. persons and institutions, including from U.S. political organizations. Now, that's big news because we know the DNC was compromised, but we also know that the RNC was compromised. We don't know what they took. We don't know what they have because that stuff was never released for whatever reason. But the U.S. intelligence community, this group, is important because it is made up of 17 different agencies uh, and organizations from inside the executive branch. So these are essentially every one of our intelligence communities that does this sort of work came together jointly, something that doesn't always happen in government, certainly doesn't always happen in the intelligence community as we've seen in years past, but they came together to release this. The statement, part of it, the important part read that these thefts and disclosures are intended to interfere with the U.S. election process. Such activity is not new to Moscow. The Russians have used similar tactics and techniques across Europe and Eurasia. And they, they point to an example uh, to influence public opinion at different locations. We believe, based on the scope and sensitivity of these efforts, that only Russia's senior most officials could have authorized these activities. So right off the bat, this was a month before the election. Trump knew about these claims, so much so that even in the final debate between him and Hillary, she explained to him about the 17 organizations. She explained to him about the hacks. Now... You can say, well, Trump didn't believe her. Trump uh, has his own ideas and doesn't believe this or that. But there's bigger news uh, that kind of tumble down the hill, growing bigger and bigger regarding this lie of Trump. Because after their convention wins for each candidate, what usually happens is you begin receiving intel briefings. And these intelligence briefings uh, are important to kind of start getting you into the position to know what's going on and, and to kind of prep you you know, if you do win the presidency. Uh, the intel communities made both candidates aware of these hacks, both of them. So we know for a fact that this information was handed out to both candidates during these intel briefs. So for him to say, why is this an issue now, uh, is essentially a spit in the face of all our intelligence communities because he was receiving this information as far back as this summer. So that tweet has got a lot of people riled up from and to be fair from both sides republicans and democrats so that's that's important to understand but when we go into the actual facts of the hack and this isn't what is discussed a lot uh, i want to get into some of the technical aspects a little bit before we dive into more of the political spectrum of these things the hackers are known as fancy bear they're also known as sophocy or as apartment 28 this is what we have dubbed these people uh, in our cyber community now this group groups person persons we don't know how many we don't know if it's one we believe it's a group of people working within russia's uh, upper echelon uh, they've been active since around the 2000s since the early 2000s and they've been responsible for targeting uh, and intrusions against the aerospace industry the defense department the energy uh, department uh, various forms uh, and levels of the u.s government and as well as media sectors uh, at places that you would know, television networks, uh, larger media papers, all that stuff. What's interesting here, though, in these situations, currently and in the past, is that their targets have mirrored the interests of the Russian government. So if you look at the attacks that they have been making and at the times they're making them, and you look at the issues that the Russian government is having with different states, different countries' issues, these things start to line up. Now, this is important because this leads many in the cybersecurity community to link this organization, Fancy Bear, uh, directly to the main intelligence department of Russia, otherwise known for most people as GRU, the intelligence services. So this is kind of a, a big arm of 
what we believe their intelligence community does. And this is something that Russia has been doing for decades. They try to destabilize things. This is what they do. The only problem now is that these things are getting more sophisticated, more advanced because of computers and the connectivity of the internet. Now, in April of 2016 is when this went down, uh, when we have the first incidences of us tracking, hacking, and intrusions. But even before that, this happened in 2015, and another Russian link group known as Cozy Bear also breached the network. But what's interesting about these two attacks is they're completely unlinked. So now what we have is two different organizations within Russia's government. We know Fancy Bear is somehow connected to Gru. We don't know where Cozy Bear is related. Separately went in to attack the intelligence networks uh, and the DNC, the RNC, and all these institutions. So these two together is a very interesting process. These have been vetted. We have checked these. These come from cybersecurity firms that have looked into this stuff. So we know pretty well the consensus is that this is coming from Russia. Now in the show notes I'm going to have some links into some cybersecurity experts and the firms that they work with and they'll go into more detail about Fancy Bear, about Cozy Bear, stuff you've probably never heard of before because this is, you know, well above cable news ratings because no one would understand it. But we do know that it happened. Now, how did it happen? How is an interesting question that we'll get into because this isn't your normal brute force attack to try to get passwords, to try to uh, fish for information. This was actually, the DNC hack was actually quite simple and it actually comes down to a mistake being made uh, within the DNC. So John Podesta's email was hacked and it was through a phishing email. So what happened was Hackers send emails, and this happens all the time. I get these. I'm sure people get these these emails about, oh, change your password, or we're requesting information from your bank. All fake. Something along those lines was sent. A staffer uh, within the department got hold of this, knew that this was fake, knew that this was uh, a phishing issue, sent out an email, and the email reads, Sarah, this is a legitimate email. John needs to change his password immediately and ensure that two-factor authentication is turned on on his account. Now, there's a problem with that email that was sent out uh, from Hillary Clinton's camp, and that's the misspelling. It actually should say, this is an illegitimate email. John needs to change his password. So because of a typo, because of autocorrect, or because of a misspelling, it was changed before it went out, saying that the phishing email sent out was actually a legitimate email. Because of this, the email was opened, the Trojan uh, programmer worm was entered into the network and that's how they got access to it. So this was not some super sophisticated uh, movie TV kind of hack. This was literally someone saying, hey, open this link to fix your password. Please believe us that this isn't fake. And someone saying, acknowledging that it wasn't fake. But this comes down to essentially a misspelling and a bad autocorrect. So once that happened, they got inside and they got all this information. Now what's interesting is that the, the FBI knew about this. So the FBI, they, they do have people, it's very good. They tried to contact the DNC to let them know what's going on. They phoned them and they left a message on their machines. So when the DNC people got this message, their response was to ignore it because what they thought was someone prank calling them from the FBI. So this and so now here's the second blunder that happens, which is insane to me to think that you know your networks are compromised, you know this is a serious issue. So the FBI phones the DNC and leaves a message. The message is interpreted as a, jo as a joke, they ignore it, nothing is done. But what's even funnier is the FBI office and the DNC headquarters are very, very close together. I believe it's, if you look on Google Maps, it's like a 15 to 20 minute walk from one location to the other. So they knew that this was an issue, and yet they still decided just to leave a phone call instead of sending a representative, sending someone over or an expert over. And from there, this thing started to spiral out of control, out of control, bigger and bigger and bigger, until they were in, until they could see everything, until they could take their pick of whatever they wanted 
to take and so when you when you picture this you can't picture some grandiose Jason Bourne uh, Skyfall kind of Q area of technology and stuff this was literally people making honest everyday mistakes that fell for it and the people responsible for checking up on those dropped the ball by not taking it as seriously and this leads us to where we are today in this hack and in one aspect it's kind of funny how simple it was uh, but another in another way it's just like oh my god it was that simple to have access to everything so they sat on this for months they've had this stuff and then the russian operatives within the shadow brokers and all this stuff uh, disseminated this information broke it down and started leaking this stuff through WikiLeaks, through other stuff, and the media itself within this country, the New York Times, CNN, everyone essentially became complicit and a pawn of the Russian government because the way the information was filtered out was filtered out through the news networks intentionally to cause this sort of doubt and issues. And then the FBI comes again, has issues right at the end of the election, uh, coming out and making those claims. I think it was like a week before about the possibility of reopening the case. So there's a lot of basic, basic level failings on this that is incredibly mind-boggling. And, and I'm going to link in the show notes as well for this as a deeper expose because the New York Times has a fantastic breakdown of this that's just absolutely massive, massive breakdown that goes through everything we do know, how everything happened, how the media was complicit, uh, the failings of the FBI, the failings of the DNC themselves. Um, and it's just... It's so incredible that all this is happening. And then, of course, you add that on to the fact that Trump's cabinet picks and a lot of these people have such close, close ties to Vladimir Putin, either himself or in Russia, starts taking a lot of this out of the conspiracy theory realm. And you just have to question what is actually going on. And even a lot of electors themselves now, you know, demanding uh, intelligence briefings and the like, things fell apart at a very fundamental level and that's really really scary coming from a cyber person or an expert to see that a simple misspelling or autocorrect in an email led to one of the greatest breaches of the dnc and something that could have and was intended to turn the election one way or the other seems it seems to me one of the primary purposes for this meddling was to impact Hillary Clinton's numbers with youth, with with people that she might have had problems with, millennials, et cetera. I mean, the, the, the revelations of what she had said behind the scenes about how she had supported open borders, by which she meant not just on immigration, but presumably like capital flows and, and such. I mean, she has what some call kind of cheaply and I, I think offensively a globalist vision. And that hurt her with the people that she kind of needed the most to come on. It seems to me that was by the design. But the, the problem is the way that this is playing out politically now. And I mean, I agree. It's, it's just such a just maddening story of, of kind of this internal breakdown and failure. Uh, but the way that liberals are handling this now is kind of irresponsible, too. Because you do have Republicans... I mean, you had McCain and, and Graham, who, who voiced very strong opinions on this. But you also have, you know, someone like Joe Walsh, the far right former congressman from Illinois. I mean, like a real outspoken guy was pro-Trump, and he's saying this is an outrage. Like the way Russia so obviously meddled in our election is just completely unacceptable. Yeah, the way. The magnitude of, of this and how it was done and now us knowing that the DNC was breached and even knowing that the RNC was breached, even those on the right are worried about where things are going because this is this is a massive deal. And even some of his most ardent supporters are on board saying, hey, uh, we do need to look into this. This isn't OK how this happened. And you pile on top of that his nominees for cabinet positions with such deep ties to Russia, even those on his own side are saying, we have some concerns here because this isn't looking as healthy as it should. And it's, and it's very, very 
troubling on a lot of levels. It is. And the facts are there for everyone to see. With Rex Tillerson as his Secretary of State nominee, that is clear and evident. I mean, people people are going to litigate these issues. But the problem is, is that if we need a smart resistance to Donald Trump and to his agenda in the, in, in the coming months, in the, in the coming years. And when, when liberals kind of freak out, like everyone should be freaked out about this and everyone should be upset. The problem is when people then turn around and mo- more of this is kind of like online expression, but when people turn around and say, Donald Trump is therefore not a legitimate president. The uh, the electors need these security briefings before they can vote on this. Like this, there's these move on campaigns to to raise yeah, the, the votes can... to to make them get these things. Yeah, he well, won. It's fucking nuts. I mean, <laughs> it's nuts that he won, but it's also nuts to. I mean, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago we were livid at the idea that Donald Trump's kids might get, you know, security, uh, uh, clearance. All the, I mean, his kids are a whole other story with, you know, apparently Ivanka moving into the first lady's office. And I mean, there, it's, it's a whole, there's so much that it's almost too much. Uh, and that's, this is something that goes back to Trump's kind of personality. It's so much to a process that you find it hard to focus on what we should be focusing on. You're up against the man of excess, and there's just so, like I said, I mean, there's just so much to talk about him. Uh, talk, talk about the, the way he conducts himself, the way he's going to conduct business, et cetera, et cetera. Liberals have to be smart about this. And when liberals put too many exclamation marks at the end of every sentence, they are shooting themselves in the foot because you do have conservatives who are saying this is really worrisome and we need to we need like an independent investigation. We need further intel about exactly what the Russians did and why, et cetera. Let that play out as it is. If li- it needs to it needs to play out because it's so he's not even president yet. And we've already been able to essentially in, in many respects on this have the two parties come together almost to say that this is an issue. And there were so many failings uh, th- from both sides. The, the, the Democrats had issues internally about how to deal with this. The Republicans knew the same thing but refused to, to condemn it or come out. And, I mean, even to President Obama himself, who held this information up until the October release of it, he held on to this. We, he's known about this for months and months and months, but he didn't want to blame Russia for a cyber attack because, as he said, he didn't want to be viewed as politicizing uh, intelligence. And that may have come to, to bite the Democrats in the ass in the end, but everyone is coming finally together on, hey, look, Russia, they're bad. Vladimir Putin is a badass just terrible person we need to make sure a something like this doesn't happen again b how much did they get how did it all happen exactly and where to go from there i mean because this is a scary situation because now what we're hearing of if you're looking at international news and foreign news is that russia is using the exact same sort of tactics from these groups uh from from cozy bear and the rest of them to influence elections now in Germany, something that is far easier to do on a size and scale as it was the United States. If you can influence even minimally something that happens in the United States, a massive country of the brightest people and the greatest experts, to do that on a smaller scale throughout Europe is a much easier task. And we need to get to the bottom of this to figure out how it happened, not just for ourselves, but so we can help out our allies to let them know how this stuff happens so they can be aware of this or it's going to be too late. Russia is a menace to a kind of post, you know, the NATO post World War II liberal order and and that's what made that's part of what made Trump so scary is especially on like a geopolitical level things he said about NATO. But to a degree these revelations do somewhat validate a neo conservative critique of Obama as sometimes being too timid and too cautious on the on, on the on the world stage because it's clear that part of the reason he Obama had held off on disclosing 
from all of this is that he did want Russian buy-in in Syria. He did want to work with them there, and he didn't want to unnecessarily antagonize them. But Russia has been doing this for a long time, and how they how they meddled forcefully in the Ukraine and you know, shut off electricity, they, they are a menace, and they should be treated as such. And what they did is completely unacceptable, but liberals need to be smart about this. And if liberals turn around and just refuse to let the facts speak for themselves and say we need to postpone the electoral college voting all these electors need security uh, briefings which is nuts and is never going to happen is completely that's crazy yeah i mean yeah. it's it almost seems the overreaction to it is only going to hurt what needs to be done internally it undermines the credibility and liberals just in general need to be smart about this moving forward i mean even some of the stuff like talking about how mike pence is scarier than Trump, which we, uh, you and I probably have. I mean, a lot of us have, but we do need to show conservatives and libertarians and other people, kind of on the center right and right, who are opposed to Trump, that our that our opposition, so much of it is non ideological, and we need to have a, an like a ideology free coalition that is anti-trump where we can you know we can still disagree on on gun control and 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 how high taxes should be or how how high spending should be etc but we agree across the aisle about the way that donald trump is relentlessly assaulting democratic norms and civil rights etc so liberals need to keep that in mind moving forward like tone down the shrillness we all share your outrage. As a liberal, I'm outraged too. This stuff spooks the hell out of me. But be smart. Let the keep pressing on and let the facts speak for themselves. But lay off some of these arguments about <laughs> lay off the most extreme arguments. That is, yeah. is not that's not gonna help. Your your moral outrage doesn't validate your strategy. Right, they need to be careful with that. I mean, I've seen it on, I've seen it everywhere from both sides. Uh, the liberals screaming up a storm about this on Facebook and elsewhere. But the louder you get, the more wild you get. The harder it is to get to the facts because you're just layering and layering on top of those uh, with with feelings and anger and stuff. And any position of anger always is a terrible place to be, regardless of what side you are coming at it from an angry position. It, you're never going to get it done, and it, this needs to be handled. Um, I think it will be handled, but we won't know. And this is one of those things. I mean, we have so, so much information, and they said they're going to release more before the inauguration and all this stuff, but this goes this goes pretty deep, and there's some fundamental flaws in how this happened that is hard to kind of fix. I mean, how do you, you know, how do you fix an email that gets autocorrected wrong? You know, you can't there. You can't really set up checks for that. <laughs> I mean, that just happens. I guess you could just turn off autocorrect and make everyone spell the old-fashioned way. I guess that would work too. But that actually just, might be a better program. <laughs> that might be a better. You know, I mean, technology is a beautiful, right? crazy is a is a beautiful thing, but it's also the first thing that's going to let you down. And we know this just from this podcast and working on this alone, like. It's it's so great, and Skype is so great, and these interviews and these recordings are so great. But the first time something can go wrong, it's gonna go wrong, and it's going to let you down when you need it the most. And that's kind of what happened here. It just and like I said with the baby boomer generation, like they don't understand how it works. You know, a lot of people, even my parents and people I know, think, well, when you send an email, I'm just sending it to that person directly, like. Um, delivering a letter to them by hand you know they don't understand where it goes what networks it has to go through where it bounces off i mean it's insane and if this is one of those situations where it kind of opens our eyes or opens administration's eyes to the need for cybersecurity experts to listen to these people when they say something's wrong uh then maybe some good will come of it because I say don't look at the movies for how these things happen, but there is one thing you can look at all these movies. There's always that one person or one security expert saying, shit's about to happen, we need to stop this, and those people in charge ignoring it. And that's, in that respect, that happened here. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, we turn to the very end. We turn to something that's from nuts, sinister, dangerous, etc., to just nuts, which is this uh, Star Wars story. <laughs> Which I'm going to see 
tomorrow night. Oh, beautiful. I'm excited, but I'm also going to be drugged up because I have a minor surgery in the morning. So I I might find it uh, to be an an enlightening experience on that stage. (laughs) You're probably going to have to see it twice. (laughs) I might have to see two or three. I mean, that's probably going to happen anyways. But yeah, you're right. There is some controversy around Rogue One. And that's not the controversy that people and critics are calling this the greatest Star Wars movie on par with Empire Strikes Back. I'll see about that tomorrow. That's an exciting thing if they're true. Uh, But it's stirred up some issues with the alt-right and the the Trump uh, people, those lovely people that we love to talk about. And their mouthpieces are actually calling for a boycott of not only Rogue One, but the entire Star Wars franchise as it's become, I quote, too politicized. Uh, And they went on to say that it's explicitly anti-Trump even though this movie has been done for about a year and has been in post-production for like eight, nine, ten months. So, I mean, you know, dates are weird with these people. But uh, I think it's it's funny, and the hashtag uh, was minorly trending on Twitter. Most of that is, is actually people picking up on it as a joke, but it's hashtag dump Star Wars. Uh, and it kind of blew up around November 4th, and, and it's just kind of, building, 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 building. And I think it's hilarious uh, that this is kind of what they're against. And I also find it interesting that uh, a lot of people are coming together behind the film uh, as a tool to kind of shove it in their face. And, as you know, it's the Empire versus the Rebels. And just to at all make this something, (laughs) something to boycott is really insane and i think it's it's hilarious in that aspect um and a lot of this has to do with with some of the star wars cast the older cast mark hamill coming out and uh you know talking about what their thoughts on the election stuff as and it, it, it's silly when you think about it but almost like mark hamill says something so that automatically must mean luke skywalker uh, is a hillary supporter you know the the logical leap people make that their actors in a role you can enjoy this their poli- their politics don't matter it's to me it's absolutely hilarious um and it's only and it's going to be even more hilarious because of course it's a star wars film it's going to break even more box office records it's insane <laughs> well uh, we live in a time where just virtually anything and everything under the sun can and will be politicized at some point i i, I tend to think most of these issues i mean it's kind of like stuff about that that black santa it's just it, it's just very, the the internet is amplifying the these kind of fringe voices who have these yeah. opinions on these things and it and it's funny but on the other hand at the same time that everything is politicized there are things that kind of will be and always will be beyond politics and sports is one of them and I would venture to say Star Wars is probably one of the other ones. And I think m- most people, uh, regardless of how they feel about the politics of any of these actors, writers, or directors, or anyone else, they still want to see Star Wars. <laughs> they're uh, they're going to complain, they're going to whine, and they're going to quietly go see it because it's Star Wars and they were all kids and they all loved it. I mean, that's just what it is. They just need something... Uh, to to boycott and to make them feel you know everybody needs their safe space whether you know on any side and you know when they feel that it's being taken away from them they're gonna they're gonna boycott but they're still gonna go see it because it's it's fucking star wars it's an american institution i mean you're gonna see star wars come on politics the story hasn't changed it's still it's the empire versus the rebels if you see yourself as one or the other that's on you (laughs) No, of course. I mean, the story doesn't change, and The Force Awakens was basically the first one rehashed. I mean, it was it's a, just a remake, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a remake that was technically, I guess, its own story, sort of. But yeah, I mean, the, the politics should stop at you know Alderaan's edge. I mean, they're and they will. Everyone's going to go see this movie. It's going to break all kinds of records. I mean, I haven't seen anything since Moonlight, but even I will probably try and head out and see this one. <laughs> They say it's good. They say this is the greatest Star Wars film since Empire Strikes Back, which is probably the only Star Wars film I go back to see uh, on a regular basis because it was fantastic. It's so the only we'll one see. I actually passionately care about. Um, but Me know, too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all the other ones are fine, I guess, but 
Empire the first Strikes one Back. is okay. The last one is is you know silly, and you know Luke Skywalker is basically terrible at everything he does and needs to be saved by everyone. The second one is great. Ends on a downer. Everything's awesome. So they're lining this one up with that in terms of quality writing and acting. And if that's true, I'm all for that. That'll be exciting. Same. Plus Felicity Jones is in it. So score. Felicity Jones is awesome. And with that, we bring another fantastic episode to a close. We go on and on and on. We hope you learned a lot today. If you want to find out more about anything we talked about, head over to our show notes. You can find those on YouTube. They're in the comments down below or in the description. You can head over to our Facebook page as well, uh, Facebook forward slash Politispeak Weekly. We have the show notes that we filter out through there. There's lots of ways. Make sure to subscribe and rate us on YouTube or on iTunes. That would be fantastic. If you're over on YouTube, leave a like, comment, uh, subscribe. You can follow us on Twitter at Politispeak Week. Uh, we like to be active on there. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can email us at politispeakweekly at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook. We've had some some interactions on Facebook this last week, and they've been fantastic. Uh, just make sure, you know, this is an open community. We're friendly. Uh, we'll get back to you. And we'll get back to each other. Uh, just try to keep it civil. You know, if you have something to say or you want to post a link to somewhere to, to back up your points, we'd love to see all that. It's fantastic. We can all come together, at least on that level of civility. So... If you do want to support the show in any way, uh, besides all those fancy things you could do, you can find us on Patreon, uh, Politispeak Weekly, if you search for us or in the show notes. Uh, and that's kind of it for us today. We will be back with you again next week. We think we're going to mix things up a little bit next week and bring you something fun. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll see you in the new year. We'll see you where Politispeak Week goes from here. But we want to thank all the hundreds of you that have downloaded already and that are listening and doing all this stuff. It's really fun. Me and Nate love to get together to chit chat uh, and we hope that you guys enjoy it as well. So until next time, I'm George. That's Nate. This is Politispeak Weekly and we will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.